How's it going guys? I am Connor from Running Warehouse and we're back at it with another episode of the Running Warehouse Connection. Now, over the past couple months, we've had on a lot of amazing ultra marathon athletes and today we've got another one. She's got top finishes at some of your favorite ultra marathon races like Western States, UTMB, Run Rabbit Run, and she's also an ultra endurance coach. We've got Amanda Basham. Amanda, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. And you know, like I said, you've had amazing finishes at all these races and I'm going through your results and year after year, you're so consistent. Where did this whole ultra marathon journey begin? So actually I kind of got, I got into the ultra running and trail running in general, like accidentally I ran in college. Well, I ran my first um, long distance year, my senior year of high school. And so then I was able to run in college for a couple of years. And once I stopped running in college, I just ran roads and it wasn't, I mean, I was very mediocre in terms of like elite athletes. Like I didn't hit that mark on the road scene, but I just really enjoyed running. And if you're not on a team, you know, you just kind of run longer and longer. So I got her after doing my first Boston marathon and I didn't know what was wrong and I couldn't run on the roads or it would hurt my foot. And I finally went and ran on trails just purely so that I could get back to training for the road marathon. And I just liked it way better. My foot felt better. I could run without any pain and it was just more enjoyable too. So I looked up races on trails and at the time it was basically like 50 K or longer. There weren't really the shorter races. So figured if I did a marathon, I could do 50 K. So <laughs> tried it out and it kind of just got longer and longer after that. Perfect. Well, so you've done all these amazing ultra marathons. Do you have a favorite one that you've done over the years? I mean, I, I'm sure it's hard to kind of narrow it down to just one, but is there any that stand out to you? Um, for sure. I mean, Western States and UTMB. Um, I'd say a lot of, a lot of people in the sport are probably going to tell you that if they've done both. Um, Western is just like, I really like the competition at Western. It's always, really competitive and the volunteers are amazing and the energy there is really great. And so racing is just really fun. Um, cause you have like the energy of the people around you watching and then also the competition, which like just brings out better performances in everyone when you're racing against really fast people. So I, I love Western, um, definitely want to go back there and I've been there several times. And then UTMB week is just amazing. Like, hanging out in Chamonix, France, and then circumnavigating Mont Blanc. Like, who wouldn't want to do that? Who likes trail running? <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, so you've had all these top finishes. You're very consistent, but things don't always go right on race day. Have, have you had any experiences um, out on the trails where you've actually gotten lost? I know that that's actually a very easy thing to happen in an ultra marathon. Yeah, you know, not as much as you'd think for how much, how many races I've done. Um, I have gotten lost, but it's never been terrible. It's just a little, it's just kind of defeating, like any time that you do get lost, even if it's like a half a mile, and then you have to turn around and you've added a mile. Um, so actually one time that I got lost, I feel like I haven't gotten lost in a while, but one time I got lost, it was the Leadville, um, not the hundred miler, but, um, what was it? The marathon. So I did the Leadville marathon and it was actually how I met my really good friend, Claire Gallagher, which you probably know who she is. Yeah. Um, so I w I think I was a little bit in front of her, but then I got lost. I got really irritated. And so I started walking cause I was being a baby. But then Claire comes walking up behind me and, you know, she's super chatty and, and definitely not an introvert. So she just starts talking to me like, oh, you're having a bad day too. I'm having a terrible day. And that was how we met and became friends. So, you know, it's benefited me in some ways. Wow. Well, you know, I feel like whenever I talk with ultra marathoners, they're always, there's always some story of getting lost and that's kind of the nature of running ultras but also with ultras, just how long they are 
things just go wrong. Uh, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you out uh, on the course on race day? Well, actually, uh, the craziest, I'd say, was at CCC last year. Um, well, 20, I guess we've passed 2020, so 2019 CCC. I had about, I think, like, maybe 10K left. And I think it's about 10K, and I was going up the last, like, huge climb. And there was an apex. Um, it's a big, like, uh, mountain goat type thing with huge horns that, like, curl around and it charged me twice and it freaked me out um and then I, I had to wait I tried to pass it twice and it charged me both times and then but just kind of like to scare me but we were on single track like steep single track there's nowhere else I'm going um so I had to wait for someone behind me who had poles and they because I didn't use poles so they had their poles out and like kind of shoved it up to the animal um just to scare it off and it finally ran off. Um, I have weird animal things. Like I've, I've been charged by a cow too during uh, the Transalpine stage race. No, it's, it's crazy. Like cows are actually very uh, a, a more aggressive than you think because we have that here in San Luis Obispo. And that that's how I feel like for me, what I get attacked by the most and they, they can like do some damage. You know, those are, they're big creatures. <laughs> Yeah, they're huge. They freak me out. I tell people that, like, I don't like the cows. There's this trail um, called Dirty Bismarck here that's really just a well-known, common, like, flat and fast loop. But there's tons of cows out along the whole thing. Um, and anytime those cows block the trail, I don't even attempt to go around them. I just turn around. <laughs> but it's because of Transalpine. So when, we were, when I was at Transalpine, it was the last day, and it had a baby with it. And everyone just was going flying past it because um, it was kind of off the trail. And then by the time I got there, it kind of was a little bit closer, but it still wasn't on the trail. So I tried to go past it. And I think I got too close to its baby and it completely like charged right at me. And luckily um, some people around me like kind of yelled at it and got it to stop. But that was scary. Wow. Yeah, that that is scary because... You already got the adrenaline, you know, from the race or from running. And then when you have that happen, it's just, you know, another spike. <laughs> but yeah. uh, well, they had the huge horns, too. I, I was not messing around with it. No, no, those those could cause some damage. <laughs> uh, well, that's crazy. I mean, whenever we talk with ultra marathoners, I feel like um, it always comes up about uh, hallucinations out on the trail. And I know Courtney DeWalter has always you know, sometimes she sees animals, you know, they're not actually there. Have you ever had uh, a case where uh, you were pushing your body so hard that you actually were uh, hallucinating out on the trail? Yes, there, I've had two that I remember, two races I remember um, very well. And the first one was my first 50 miler was the Mount Hood 50. And it was so hot. I had no idea what I was doing with like fueling and hydration and stuff. And of course, I'm like running way too fast, um, which, you know, that ended up being, too, being fine, but it was in the 90s. And I ended up seeing a, I was so thirsty and this stuff I was using just was not working. It was giving me a really upset stomach and it was liquid calories. So then I stopped using it and I had no liquid and no calories. So bad combination. Um, so then I started seeing a, I saw a boat and a refrigerator and I stopped and looked at it a couple of times. Cause I'm like, there's no way that there is a boat out here. Like just sitting off the side of the single track. <laughs> so I knew I was hallucinating, but I was seeing it. Uh, so that was my first time with it. And that was uh, really interesting and weird. Um, I had another one at uh, UTMB. It was less weird. I just kept seeing, I thought I kept seeing people but it was usually just like tree stumps. And I think UTMB, it took way longer than I expected. That was not a, a great performance of mine. And I think you're just out there and so remote for so long, like by yourself, not talking, you just get weird. <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like hallucinations are kind of like something that all ultra marathoners encounter at some point. And, it is just one of those things that when you're pushing your body to the limit, uh, you know, it, it just kind of happens. Now, 
I imagine also that uh, fueling correctly will will kind of help um, make that not happen as much. Over the years, how have you gone about fueling, and is that something that you've kind of dialed in uh, more recently? Yeah, you know, I think it's something you constantly have to work on because sometimes something will work for a while and then all of a sudden it won't. So that can be a little frustrating, especially with longer distances. But for a long time with like all the road running I was doing and then the first couple years of of ultra running, I was just using goo. And I mean, I could eat those all day and it worked great. Like my stomach never hurt. I hardly had to eat real food. Um, the second I took one, it was just like rocket fuel. And I mean, I remember the... Um, Cayuga Trails 50 was one of my earlier races. I think it was my first race when I ran for Nike. And I, by the end of that race, I was having four goo an hour and it felt great. And now if I have one goo, it messes up my stomach. So I've switched to spring um, and I eat a lot of normal food. So it's completely changed over the years. And now I'll like mix in the spring with a lot of normal food, like CCC, I had croissants. Um, a lot of times I eat PB and J and, um, yeah, so pretty much now I feel like I've done it long enough that now I've figured out how my body feels like when I need more. So I keep rough track of like hundred I'm a little like 150 calories an hour roughly. And I'll try to stick around that. But if it comes to the time and I'm just not feeling like I need it, then I just won't have it. Or if I need more, then I'll have more. So I'll have a rough plan and then kind of go with how I feel. And I think after a while, you can kind of do that. Yeah, and I also imagine the farther you go, the different distances you're you're gonna adjust. And I, I the uh, when you start going like 100, 150, 200, um, you know, fueling is definitely very critical. What's the farthest distance you have gone and what's the farthest you'd consider going in the future? (laughs) Depends on if it's all at once or if it's split up. (laughs) Um, So the furthest, I'm not sure which one's farther. So I know UTMB is like about 105 miles, not actually 100, but in terms of time, it's forever. Uh, Run Rabbit Run is a, when I did it, it changes a little bit every year. When I did it, I think it was 107 miles. So right around there, kind of the same. Um, In terms of time, the time difference was like uh, eight hours or something. Yeah, so it probably felt a little longer, even though it was about the same distance. (laughs) Oh, UTMB felt like I ran 300 miles. It was insane. Um, So, you know, I think all at once, 100 miles, I'd like to dial down 100 milers better. But I love stage races. So like Transalpine um, was a seven day stage race that I did. It started in Germany um, and ends in Italy. And it's intense. It had, I think 154 miles in the week with 54,000 feet of vert, I'm pretty sure. And it's fast because it's broken up. Like stage races are pretty fast every day because you get nighttime to recover. Um, so those are really fun. So, I mean, I would do, I don't, I don't know what their max would be, but if you could do like something long where you're doing like 50 miles a day, I would do something like that. Yeah. No, that's interesting. That, that throws in a whole nother factor of, you know, recovery and, you know, getting ready for the next day. And it, even though it isn't maybe a 200 mile race, it, it throws in totally different factors. So that's interesting. Um, okay, so now you, you've ran all these amazing races, Western States, UTMB. Um, it sounds like you've been out to Leadville, but you've never actually done the Leadville race. Are there any other uh, ultra marathons that you haven't done that you'd really like to do in the future? Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to do Leadville. Um, it's hard because it's so close to UTMB, and I just love going over there for that. Um, but I do want to do the Leadville 100 at some point. Um, there's a lot of the ultra trail world tour races, like, uh, the Madeira, um, I believe Madeira is 70 K. I can't remember. It, it might be longer than that. Um, but it's in Portugal, really pretty. Um, 
I went to Cape Town. That was amazing. So got that one done. Um, there's another one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it's one of the Ultra Trail World. Oh, Ultra Trail Australia. Um, yeah, so I've been to Australia once, but it was for work. And um, I mean, I still got to like run around the trails, so it didn't feel like work, but it'd be cool to go do the 100K there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many great races. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, even pick which one uh, you you want to do because, you know, there's only so much time in a year. But let's um, move forward now. What is, like, your current training situation like? And with all the kind of uncertainty in the air, um, what is your future racing schedule looking like? Well, I mean, this year's been a little mixed bag for everyone, I think. But definitely has for me um, because I haven't been training very well. Um, so the first few months we, I ended up being able to get a lot of travel in. And at the time it's funny because at the time I'm like, man, I can't wait till I just get like a month at home without travel. And then I came back from the last thing, which was training for the like Sonoma 50 on the course. And then COVID happened. And then I'm like, dang it, I just want to travel. <laughs> so I got what I wished for, I guess. But um, I guess I didn't really want it. because It's been way too long. Uh, so since then, so I went to Hawaii. I ran an FKT beginning of the year. Then went to train for Lake Sonoma. Came back. And the day that I got back, the race was basically canceled. Because um, that's when COVID kind of took off. And at first it was a little hard to like, I was, I just felt like I was so ready to race and I love racing and I wanted to try to get into Western States. And so I was a little bummed, but then, um, it kind of helped after a few weeks of it to realize that like I would run whether there were races or not. So I was starting to enjoy it again, but then I got pregnant. <laughs> so I haven't been training, um, like my normal self, uh, especially lately, it's been a little, a little hard. So, um, trying to do a lot more cross training and things. Yeah. And I, I, I imagine, um, you know, there's ultra marathons are always be there. You'll get back at it when, uh, to that heavy, heavy mileage when, when the time is right. But I know you're also an endurance coach. Um, can you tell us about, I mean, who are you coaching and what is your specialty? What, what kind of distances do you focus on with your athletes? So I kind of coach a very wide range, but majority of people, um, I'll take on anyone from, you know, 5k, um, is pretty common up to hundred plus miles. Um, most of my people stick around the marathon to a hundred mile distance. So still very wide range. Um, and I'd say most people, you know, work a normal job. Um, they're trying to just either PR or try different races uh, around the country or the world even um, and get into newer distances. Ultra runners like to step up the distance, you know, pretty quick. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's the majority of people. And then once in a while I'll coach like some people looking at more higher performance goals. Um, but I, I really enjoy coaching people who, um, you know, they, they kind of use running as like a mental release pretty much. And like trying to, it, it just helps them feel better in their daily life. Um, I really enjoy helping people with that. So like I have, I have uh, one athlete who is part of the addict to athlete program. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's, uh, it started in Utah and they use running to help with um recovery from addiction and he's amazing like he's such a like he's so gritty and it's just really cool to see people like that like totally turn their lives around and running is like the main thing that they're using to help cope with that and move forward so i really enjoy that yeah that, that's amazing and i i feel like recently i've started to hear about a lot of runners who either you know they ran competitively in their past or they're starting to get into marathons maybe they've done their first marathon but they want to make that step to the ultra marathon uh what is your advice to uh runners who are looking to kind of make that next step forward so you know for some reason maybe this is because of COVID. i've had people ask me that a lot lately um and i think 
the biggest first thing, what people do that they shouldn't is automatically just increase the volume they're doing. But what I would say is don't increase what you're doing and try to get on trails more first. Just do what you're doing, especially if you're training for a marathon. Um, do what you're doing, but try to get some of your, your runs on trails because that alone is gonna add to the total time duration because it's gonna be slower. It's always slower, even if it's like fast, you know, fast, flat trails. It's gonna be a little slower. So instead of six hours for the week, you'll probably be at like eight to 10 hours with the same mileage. And that time on feet is already gonna to add to stress on your body, even though it is trails and it's softer and like your joints are gonna be better, but it's still stress that's added. And so if you went from, um, if you added your mileage and you're trying to get into trail running, then it's gonna probably be too much too fast and it's gonna to lead to an injury at some point. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great advice. And, uh, you know, you've, you've been around the block a few times, so you understand uh, what this whole ultramarathon training world is like. And you not only, uh, um, you know, have the knowledge in the training aspect, but I know you know your product. Can you tell us, you know, when you're going through these ultramarathons, there's so much stuff you need for race day. Can you tell us about some of your, your favorite gear um, that you use, you know, actually on day to day and on race day? Yeah, so I'd say shoes are like the thing I think of first. Um, so I'll choose my shoes depending on, I mean, daily too. So I'll wear different shoes depending on um, what terrain I'm running on, uh, what time of year it is. So if it's muddy, and rainy, or snowy, uh, if it's cold outside, cold and wet, then maybe I'll need a waterproof one with better terrain or better uh, tread so I don't slip around. Or it, depending on the distance, I might run something in something a little more minimal versus like a really high cushion shoe. So I'll change that every day, which I think it also increases like the variability of um, the, like what you're running on. And so it'll keep your feet a little stronger too, because you're using different muscles a little bit. Um, basically every time you run, instead of running in the same exact shoe, same movement, um, every day. So with races, I'll think of those same things, like what the distance is, what the train is like, like if it's technical or if it's really smooth, uh, if it's going to be muddy or snowy or totally dry. And that'll determine, you know, what features of the shoe I need. If I need something minimal, but with really great tread or something super high cushion, but it could be a road shoe. Um, those different things. So, so I'm curious, what are some of your favorite shoes right now that, that you do bring out for that daily training? All the, those different situations you talk about, what for you is kind of the, the shoes you go to? So I'd say right now I have three I've been using a lot. Um, well, the last few months. So as Galante Racer, which is actually a road shoe, um, it's like, it's basically like a road flap. Um, the Temp 2, and the superior and i've been i've i'm lucky enough to try the shoes before they're out so i'm trying the what will be the newest superior and it's great by the way um it's gonna be solid it had some problems it, it didn't have problems but i wanted it to be i didn't feel like it was a hundred mile shoe but i i love it up to 100k and so i wanted to try to have them make it to where it works really well for hundred mile without losing like its features that people love about it, like being minimal and um, being able to feel the ground and everything. So I feel like it's basically there. Um, so I've been using those three. Um, the Escalante racer I'll use for like road or treadmill. Um, some trail that's super smooth and flat, but very rarely because it's exposed foam and it, has no tread, uh, but it's great for like fast workouts. Um, the Timp is kind of an everyday, uh, longer distances. It's got really great tread. You can take it on any kinds of trails, technical, muddy, uh, and do your long runs in it, like endurance stuff. And then the Superior, I really like for uh, not just racing, but for like faster trail days. 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, the Superior is a little lower to the ground. It does have that very nimble experience, so I can see why on faster days um, you'd bring that out. And it's also exciting to hear that kind of through your feedback, you're kind of making it um, a little bit more shoe that, that can handle the 100 but still has those aspects that people love because that, that really is, I mean, here at the warehouse, a favorite of so many runners. So obviously you don't want to change it too much, but it looks like moving in the right direction. And even uh, the Timp, too, I, I feel like that's a shoe that is so versatile. Um, I feel like so many people bring that shoe out for literally any type of trail. It can kind of handle it all. So that's another solid pick. When the trails get, um, I, I guess when you're going really long distances, um, maybe if the, the terrain is pretty uneven, is there one of those three shoes that you use or um, is there a different shoe when, you're, when you really want a lot of cushioning underfoot? When I want a lot of cushioning, um, I'll use the Olympus. So, and really, um, it's purely for comfort, but then also the Olympus has really great tread. So if you're like, say something like UTMB during a stormy year, you're going 105 miles. Uh, so you're going to want the cushion with a lot of vert, a lot of like big downhills. Your feet get sore after, you know, 30 hours of running and hiking. Um, but then it's got really great tread. I, I'm pretty sure it's Vibram. It's a Vibram outsole. That thing I ran, I actually used it a lot during Transalpine where we were running through a lot of river crossings and like a lot of wet rocks and stuff. I've never found a shoe that works as well on anything wet like that, especially wet rocks. They're usually just slippery no matter what. So I really like that one if I'm like really wanting to max everything out. Yeah. And so you, you bring up all these amazing ultra shoes. Have you always been um, running in zero drop shoes or is this something that you've transitioned in over time? Uh, what is your experience with zero drop shoes? Yeah, so I have not ran in them forever. Um, I, when I first got into road running after college, I ran, I think I had a random, like I would try different shoes all the time because it, nothing felt great. So I tried Adidas, um, I think maybe some Saucony, and they were all very um, high offset. I think they were all like 10 to 12 millimeters. And then I, once I ran for Nike, I started wearing Nikes and they have a lot of like, they have a very wide range of, of shoes. And the ones that I found that I liked were mainly the trail ones and they were lower offset. So they were like four, I know the Kyger was four millimeters. The Wild Horse might've been six. Um, and I loved those. They were, they made my feet feel so much better. And so I ran in those primarily, um, those in like the Nike free, if I was on the road for a couple of years. So when I transitioned to ultra, it actually wasn't a huge change because I was already like pretty low compared to like the standard shoe. Um, so they've always worked really well for me. And I went, I don't always, you know, it depends on the person, if you can transition, you know, how quickly you can transition into zero drop. Totally depends on your like foot strength and what you've been wearing and everything. But I went a hundred percent into it. Now yeah, that that's, that's amazing to hear. And, you know, the shoes are exciting, but it's kind of only one piece of the puzzle, especially in the ultra marathon. Um, gear also kind of represents um, vests, watches, you know, everything that you're kind of wearing on body. Uh, what is your go-to uh, gear on race day? Uh, I started wearing, so for, I'll, I'll talk about all those, but I started wearing um, rabbit apparel this year. And I can't believe I haven't worn it a long time ago. I mean, they're not, they're not a very old company, but their material is so soft. Like it's so functional. It's been by far the best stuff that I have found. It's like not only good looking, which trail runners usually care less of that but it's cute stuff plus it's also extremely functional and the softness of their materials is uh it's amazing so if you're in if you're in clothes for eight to 30 hours you know you kind of want them to be comfy so love rabbit apparel um for my vests i've so i used 
a few different brands for a long time and I could never find ones that fit to where I felt like I could keep it stable with, um, while I was like breathing, <laughs> felt like it always like, cut off the air, like airflow and I couldn't breathe. Um, so I'd have to loosen it and then it would bounce all over the place. And I've been wearing Ultraspire for, I think three years, the last three years. And they're by far the best and, and so comfortable. Um, and they have a wide range too. So anywhere from like the best I created with them, like minimal, uh, minimal footprint. So it doesn't cover much of your body, um, up to like fast packing. So you have a wide range of different things you can wear and they make them fit so well. Like I, the things that Bryce, Bryce is the founder of Ultraspire, um, and he's come up with a lot of these ideas and the things that he creates to fit your body while you're running makes it so comfortable if you can barely tell that you're even wearing it. Yeah. Well, it's cool to hear that you have your own vest. Um, and I, I guess what went into the whole design process, what were you actually asking for? You said it's a little bit more minimal, but what were you asking for to make sure you had all the specs perfect for you, you know, come race day? Yeah, so I wanted a vest, even though I wanted it to be as small of a footprint on your body as possible. Um, you know, I don't know how much people know, but uh, vests are the most efficient way to run with water, um, the way that they sit on your body. And, you know, handhelds are, are okay if they're comfortable, but um, handhelds uh, just kind of throw off your running form sometimes. And so if you want, and then there's waste packs too, and waste packs are very efficient too. So I think waste packs and vests are the most um, efficient way to carry water. But I wanted a pack that was very minimal, but still allowed me to carry primarily enough water. And then if I had to go on a long training run, I could still carry the amount of fuel. And, you know, when you like think of that, it kind of sounds like, you well, you kind of just need a bigger vest to carry all your stuff. <laughs> So we worked together to make this as small of a footprint on your body as possible and do all of those things. And they did really well with the design of the pack, where the placement is for everything, um, how wide the straps are, the uh, type of mesh for the pockets. So it can, it's this tiny pocket up here, but it fits a really large cell phone if you want it to. Um, so different things like that, that work in such a wide variety of, of training and racing. So sometimes I'll wear it, well, I'll pretty much wear it for everything now, um, from an hour run where I just want like a water bottle to a long race where I have, you know, race requirements where you have a jacket and two water bottles and all this fuel and your phone and that all fits in it. So it's been really nice. Yeah. Well, another kind of big uh, add-on to gear really in recent years uh, is the GPS watch. You know, it seems like everyone has one now. Uh, what watch, do, do you go the GPS route or are you, are you using Strava? What, what is uh, kind of your, your GPS of choice? Yeah, so, I mean, I use Strava, but with my watch. So um, I use the Coros now. I used uh, some different brands for a while and they, they just weren't staying charged very long. They didn't seem very accurate. Um, I even had worn a few together and I mean, it was like all over the place, like a few mile difference. Elevation gain was just like not even comparable. And then I finally tried Coros uh, this year actually. So I haven't been using it very long and it's insane. Like the hype of how long that battery lasts is, it's not just hype. It's I mean, I went like three weeks without charging it. Um, the accuracy is amazing. It, the second you're done, it uploads onto all of your platforms. Um, I mean, it's got pretty much everything you can think of. Trail running, indoor running, um, hiking, whatever, like whatever you would need it for. Um, and it's a little smaller, which is nice. So it's not so bulky on your wrist. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's great to hear that that's the kind of been the watch that's been working for you. And 
I hear all those things and they all sound good, but for ultra marathoners in particular, you know, that battery life is like key. You know, when you're out, most people don't realize uh, a lot of times when you're out for 24 hours plus uh, searching for GPS, like you, you, a lot of batteries will die. So um, the fact that the Koros has that uh, amazing a battery life is pretty special to hear. Yeah. And you can keep it on the really good GPS. So like some of the other ones that say they're, you know, 30 hours or more, you have to, um, in order to make it last that long, you have to do like the GPS updates every minute, every minute or five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. Um, so that it doesn't use as much, but you can keep the Coros on like the most accurate setting and it'll still last forever. Yeah, that's insane. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely have to try that, that watch out uh, in the future. Um, but thank you again for giving us a little look into your full gear lineup, really from, from head to toe. Um, yeah. We're going to move it on now to the fan questions. We, we reached out on social, got a lot of great questions. So the first one I got for you, uh, what's your favorite way to spend time besides running? Uh, you know, we're talking so much running, but uh, yeah, what do you like to do outside of out of the running world? Um, well, I love spending time with my family. I don't see them very often. Um, I guess I see them pretty often for them living in a different state, but I live in, I moved to Colorado and I lived in Utah for a few years and my family's not there. I do have um, an aunt and uncle in Colorado Springs, so they're a couple hours away now. But my parents and my sister and my niece, they're all in Oregon. A lot of my cousins are in Oregon too. Um, so I like to try to spend time with them as much as I can. Um, anytime I am with them, running is definitely like not the top priority. I uh, put that on the back burner. Uh, I also, well, I had three dogs until recently. One of them passed away. But I did have three dogs. Um, and until uh, the one of them, my oldest one, passed away maybe like three or four weeks ago. And so until then, I mean, they were like, I felt like I had children. <laughs> uh, they're, I, I spend a lot of time with them. They're very spoiled dogs. Uh, so, I mean, that was like half my day, every day. I still have two. And one is a cattle dog who is extremely hyper. So she requires um, a lot of hiking, a lot of ball throwing, um, a lot of cuddling. So, and then of course I love spending time with my boyfriend, Justin. So that's, that pretty much takes up all my time. Awesome. <laughs> well, moving on to the next question. Uh, this, this really hits home for us here in California, but I, I know it's probably affected you a little bit uh, as well. What are your best tips for uh, rough weather and training conditions like the smoke right now we're seeing on the West Coast? Ooh, it's, I mean, it's pretty bad. I would definitely, I'm on the West Coast. If your option is either not running or running in an AQI of 500 or even more, like don't run. That's worse. Like I understand people like running is more than just for health reasons. It's, I mean, more than like physical health, but like mental health too. But man, it is bad. It's like smoking cigarettes to go run in uh, AQI of even like, 200. Um, I think it, it's bad air quality, it, like signals you that it's bad air quality on like all the weather apps if it's above 100. Um, if you can, th it would be a good time to run on the treadmill. Um, even that just in your house is going to be a lot better than outside. Or if you can go to a gym where the air is totally filtered, that's that would be the best. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I've been doing recently, just because the air outside, you, I mean, you can, you can see ash in the air and uh, you just know whatever benefits you're getting from running are going to be negated from the horrible air quality. So it's, it's been rough, but we're, we're hoping to uh, see some improvements in the future. But for now, we're kind of just keeping our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, hopefully there's some rain that wipes it all out. Definitely, definitely. Um, Final question for you. Uh, do you have any FKT uh, attempts in the future? I know you said you had one recently in Hawaii. 
Uh, are there any FKT, maybe not in the near future, because it sounds like training has been a little bit on a hiatus, but are there any FKT attempts that you'd like to do uh, in the future? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm pregnant, but I'm due in January, like early January. So I got all of 2021, man. I'm already planning. <laughs> so got some races planned, but then I haven't thought specifically which FKTs, but I would love to do four pass. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the four pass loop in Colorado. No. So it's like Maroon Bells area. Okay. And okay. it goes up four different peaks. It's a big loop. It's about, I think it's 20 six miles somewhere around there um all super high so it's above ten thousand feet the whole time um really pretty i would love to do that one one i just recently found out about this year because justin actually attempted it um is the pawnee buchanan loop uh this is also in colorado it's only maybe 45 minutes from where we live now super pretty um it's also all very high it's 27-ish miles. Um, but man, it's just like, it's got a little bit of everything. Like, um, really good, like, flat, or not flat, but like downhill sections that you could really rip on. But then some good, like, hiking and technical parts, too. So I kind of like when you mix them up a little. Yeah. I mean, FKTs right now, I feel like, are really exciting, especially with not many solid dates for races in the near future. And we talked with Courtney Dewalter recently and she'd had that uh, 500 mile Colorado trail FKT attempt. What do you think? Is, is that something that you would consider in the future? How crazy uh, was that trek? <laughs> so, you know, I didn't think that I would. And then we actually went and ran part of the Colorado trail. And I had ran parts of it before, but I don't think I realized that, oh, this is the Colorado trail. And we ran a part of it and I was thinking like, man, that'd be really cool. I would totally do that. So, you know, who knows? I'll have mom strength next summer. So that might be able to get me through it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we, we look forward to seeing that attempt. And uh, if anyone can do it, it it's you. But uh, we're going to have to keep up to date uh, with all um, your future races. If people want to keep track of you, keep track of, you know, what's coming in the future, where can they find you on social media? Uh, so my main thing is Instagram and it's very easy. It's at Amanda underscore Basham. Um, I also have Facebook. It's just Amanda Nicole Basham. I don't really use the athlete page. I use the actual like Facebook page. Um, and then my website is amandabasham.com. So, you know, if people are interested in coaching or want to ask training questions or anything like that, uh, my email and all of that is on there. Perfect. You know, Every time we have ultra marathon athletes on the show, I get super excited because what you guys do is literally unreal. I coming from the the distance side, but the shorter distance stuff, it's it's really inspiring to see uh, what you guys accomplish out on the trail. So I look forward to seeing more of you in the future. And uh, you know, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Awesome. Well, until next time, that was the Running Warehouse Connection.